All right, so I'd like to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, first, this is the Tyndall Lecture, and uh, it's called the Tyndall History of Global Environmental Change Lecture, and it honors the life and work of physicist John Tyndall. Tyndall's measurements made in the late 1850s and the early 1860s verified the importance of the greenhouse effect that had been proposed in 1824 by Fourier. The Tyndall Lecture is selected, or lecturer, is selected in recognition of outstanding contributions to our understanding of global, global environmental change. And this year, our Tyndall Lecture will be given by Inez Fung. And Inez is a professor of atmospheric science in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science at the University of California, Berkeley. She holds an appointment in the Department of Environmental Science, Policy, and Management as well. Inez has published numerous peer-reviewed journal articles, uh, too many to count, and uh, she has also received numerous awards but I know that you came to hear Inez, so let me just list a few of her awards. One of, is, that's familiar to most all of us is the prestigious Roger Ravel Medal, which she won a number of years ago. She's also a fellow of AGU, a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, and she's an elected member of the U.S. Academy of Sciences. I, was also, I also wanted to mention, and I did not know this, although I've known Inez for a while, was that Jewel Charney was her advisor. So she has quite a pedigree as well. And so today, <clears throat> her presentation is Projecting Change, Lessons, and Outlook. And I'd like to invite Inez to come up. There you are. Let's give her a round. Thank you, thank you for the honor of, of, giving, of giving the Tyndall Lecture. When I got the invitation, I got very intimidated. I was very flattered and I was very intimidated about the history. First thing is note that I'm very old, that I can talk about history. But the second is that the field has, has grown so much that it is impossible to talk about history. So I have chosen to talk about projecting change and how we have gone uh, to, to just weather forecasting, et cetera, to what we've been talking about, IPCC projections. What I have put in the background, I think many of you recognize, is the 2017 the, for the solar eclipse, the path. And I look at that and I say, my gosh, you can do, you can do it by the minute what the sun is. So one is, wow, that is really, <laughs> that is quite a model for, for all the astronomers. Uh, but also I thought how boring it would be to be able to do it to that level. So I think what, what uh, now I have to figure out how to operate this thing. I don't know which mouse, which. This one. Okay, and I still have uh, I still have uh, Steve Schwartz's talk in front of my in front of me. Um, <laughs> anyway, so Tyndall, as Alan pointed out, um, did the first measurements and direct measurement of uh, CO2, the absorption of infrared radiation by CO2, water vapor, ozone. And he pointed out that water vapor was a much more potent greenhouse gas than CO2 or ozone. So, and this is the instrument he used. I won't go through its instrument. I uh, have quite a, quite a gadget. So I'm gonna start, I'm gonna talk about how we have gained our capability in, in, in modeling. But I think I'm talking to the young people in the audience. 
And I'm going to talk about several PhD theses rather than just take you over, uh, uh, t rather than say this is what happened and this is what happened, we got bigger computers. Uh, but I want to talk about the PhD thesis that led to, that have led to what we, ca what we can do. So the first is weather forecasting. I think many of you know that L.F. Richardson did, had the very first numerical weather forecast, and this is a very marvelous book. And I'll read, just in case you can't do it. Imagine a large hall like a theater, except that the circles and galleries go right around the space usually occupied by the stage. The walls of this chamber are painted to form a map of the globe. Myriad computers, those are people, not machines, are at work upon the weather of the part of the map where each sits, but each computer attends only to one equation or part of an equation. Parallel, multi-core processing, yeah? The work of each region is coordinated by an official of higher rank. Numerous little night signs display the instantaneous values so that the neighboring op computers can read them each number is thus displayed in three adjacent zones so as to maintain communication to north and south of the map. From the floor of the pit, a tall pillar rises to half the height of the wall. It carries a large pulpit on its top. In this sits the man in charge of the whole theater. He is surrounded by several assistants and messengers. One of his duties is to maintain a uniform speed of progress in all parts of the globe. In this respect, he is like the conductor of an orchestra in which the instruments and slide rules, the instruments are slide rules and calculating machines. Okay, so this is, uh, you get, this is 1920, uh, the book is 1922, so the thinking is much before then. So, this is his, this is the, this is the Richardson model, a grid over, over Europe, and you predict temperature, pressure, uh, you predict pressure, wind, uh, and temperature. So temperature changes the density, and density changes the pressure, so difference in pressure, pressure gradient, changes the wind, and that changes the temperature. So to calculate the pressure tendency, what he predicted was 145 millibar change in six hours, and the observed was much, much less than that. Okay, so this is the very first calculation. So now we know that Richardson's error was that it was computationally unstable, that he was looking at external gravity waves with a speed of 300 meters per second. He has a grid of 200 kilometers. He should take time steps of 11 minutes, and he took a time step of six hours. Okay, so he, blew, he should blow up. However, he didn't blow up because he only took one time step. He hasn't got time to blow up, okay, in one time step. So what, what Richardson attributed his own error to be the use of unbalanced initial data was his fundamental error. Okay, so this is where the data comes in. So now I go to the first PhD thesis, which is Charney's thesis at UCLA. The Dynamics of Long Waves in the Baroclinic Westerly Current, in 19, published in 1947. So there he, he recognized that the equations of motions admitted waves of all frequencies and wavelengths, and what is important are the long waves. So the crucial things are the long waves. So in a letter from Charney to PD from, to, Phil Richards, to Phil Thompson in 1947, he said in the te terminology which you graciously described to me, we might say that the atmosphere is a musical instrument. We come back to musical instruments again. On which one can play many tunes. High notes are sound waves, low notes are long inertial waves, and nature is a musician, more of the Beethoven than of the Chopin type. He much prefers the low notes and only occasionally plays arpeggios in the treble, and then only with a light hand. 
The oceans and the continents are the elephants in Cezanne's animal suite, marching in a slow, cum cumbrous rhythm, one step every day or two. Of course, there are overtones, sound waves, billow clouds, gravity waves, inertial oscillations, etc. But these are unimportant and heard only at NYU and MIT. <laughs> so, then in the letter, same, same, from Charney to Thompson in November, Charney wrote, but the main reason is that I have been brooding about the problem of numerical computation ever since coming to Norway. And I think I have come up with an answer to at least one of the most vexing aspects, namely the practical impossibility of determining the initial vertical velocity and acceleration fields with the necessary accuracy. The solution is so absurdly simple that I hesitate to mention it. It is expressed in the following principle. Assuming conservation of entropy and absence of friction in the free atmosphere, the motion of large-scale systems is governed by the laws of conservation of potential temperature and potential vorticity and by the condition that the field of motion is in hydrostatic and geostrophic balance. This is the required filter. It really does eliminate the small-scale noise. It is possible to justify the approximation used in deriving the filtering principle by method of scale analysis analogous to the type of reasoning used in justification of the boundary layer approximations of aerodynamics. The value of the filter for numerical computation lies in the fact that the equation of motion can now be easily reduced to a single equation in pressure alone. So this is superb, because then the initial condition you need is a scalar and not vectors, and only one thing is a scalar, it is easily interpolated, etc. So we go to the first successful numerical weather forecast experiment in 1950. So here we have a grid. It, they solved the barotropic vorticity equation, grid over the US. 24-hour forecast, they made 24-hour and 48-hour forecast. It took them 33 days, days to debug the computer, and Charney, of course, was, was led. And, and the next to Charney was Norm Phillips um, in that. Um, so the, this was done on the ENIAC at the Aberdeen testing ground, the, the, the ENIAC uh, at the Naval Testing Grounds in Aberdeen, Maryland, and the ENIAC had fewer than 10 words of read-write memory. Uh, and that's one of that, fun the, the function table is the read memory. So, so this is from Platzman's uh, history. This is 16 operation. This is one time step. What is, what, is, what is shown here is one time step. So from the function table, from the memory, you pull out the Coriolis parameter, map factors, etc. And then you have to shovel them, okay, 10 words. You have to organize your cards into the right sequence, okay, and then you have punch, and then the output is punched output, and then you have to get, to make the punched output, and whatever you else get in the right sequence so that the right 10 words go in, etc. So when Platzman talked about this, it's like the, you could, the, the key punch goes like this, and you can dance the jig while you wait for the key punch, etc. So it took them 24 days to debug the code, and they only had, they, they didn't have the time to compute, to, to, to do the forecast, they had to beg for additional time on the ENIAC to, 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 to carry out the forecast. Obviously, it was, it was a successful forecast. But Richardson's error was the use of unbalanced initial data. So while Charney was able to make a 24-hour forecast, what we needed were data. So here, another transformative move, I mean, PC, here are the Nimbus satellites, and Pierre Sellers called them, and at the 40th anniversary um, of Nimbus, uh, it's the granddaddy of the current Earth-observing fleet. So you can see from Nimbus 1, you could, yeah, it was a visible, um, so you can see the cloud cover, and it goes all the way to Nimbus 7, and you can see on Nimbus 7, we, the first, 
the first, I think this is the first global map of sea surface temperature. You can see the course resolution, but you can see many of the familiar features. It's very exciting uh, <laughs> to see the first observations. And I think that Richardson, if he had, you know, Richardson would have done much better. He would still have blown up, okay, <laughs> given, given his setup, he still would have blown up, but I think not so quickly if he had the initial conditions. So the Nimbus has also produced temperature profiles, rainfall, sea ice, and, and the coastal zone color scanner, uh, other things. So Nimbus 3, and I think Tyndall would have been very happy to see this, Okay, so Nimbus 3 had an infrared sensor the, uh, and the infrared interferometer spectrometer, the iris. And so here was the first thermal emission spectrum of the Earth. And so this was on April 15th, 1969, and this is spectrum over the equatorial Pacific Ocean. So you can, see the, you can see the absorption by CO2, the water vapor, the multiple water vapor lines uh, that um, Tyndall had measured by hand using that, that clunky, that clunky, that, that uh, original instrument. So here is, the, here is the latest forecast. I just grabbed it off Windy. Uh, so I just, this is the, I, I took this several days ago trying to figure out when, when I'm departing from the airport, <laughs> what, would, what the weather would be like. But the, the marvelous thing here is that you can choose on the lower part, uh, I don't know where, uh, what, where, how do I use the sense pointer? The lower part, the lower part here, you can choose the model you want, ECMWF or the NOAA uh, GFS model. But what I want you to take a look at is on the right-hand side. We're, not, we're now predicting not just temperature, pressure, wind, okay? Uh, we're predicting carbon monoxide and, uh, and swells and, and wave height, SO2, et cetera. And recently in the California fire, I was actually looking, you looking at this to look at the carbon monoxide that goes from the, para, uh, from the Chico fire down the Central Valley and then, and then exited west to, through the Golden Gate Bridge. And so we canceled school for three days and I could see here the carbon monoxide, the wind pattern and how that affected us. So next, so I want to move on that, that this is weather forecasting now. There's a lot of work we are we, we, uh, uh, extending the forecast to two weeks, 10 days and two weeks and beyond. But now we're talking about the next thing is talking about seasonal forecasts, predicting El Ninos and La Ninas. In the PhD thesis, I want to, and so basically here, this observed is not just long time ago from, um, from, from Walker and the, the relating the pressure differences between Tahiti and Darwin in Australia, the oscillation, but also more, more importantly, the Bjergnes observed that when they're in the eastern to central equatorial Pacific, then that, that there's warmer SST and weaker, esterly, weaker easterlies. And Verki also noticed from the observations that the sea level in the western Pacific rises before the warm phase of the, of the El Nino, and he, and he came up with the idea of a recharge oscillator. So Mark Kane's PhD thesis under Charney was to look at just to, it's a totally theoretical study of waves in the equatorial ocean. So most of the work prior to that was mid-latitude Rossby waves, and so this is taking from Matsuno's studies of equatorial waves in the stratosphere, now taking it to the oceans. And so what you can see the dispersion relationship, you can see the Kelvin waves, the eastward, the, the non-dispersive Kelvin waves propagating eastwards, then, and the Rossby waves propagating westwards. And I think now when we, so everyone now knows about the Kelvin and the Rossby waves when we talk about El Nino, but this is, the, this is Mark Kane's thesis. While Mark Kane was doing that, uh, Dave Halpern, who's sitting there in the front row uh, here, he developed the moored uh, current measurements at the equator. So you can see the mooring people throwing this. But what 
they, I, and I would invite Dave to talk about it. There's a railroad tie that goes to the bottom of the ocean, and the cable is four meters shorter than the depth of the ocean, so that it would remain taut in the, in the presence of currents, and then you hand attach all the current meters. Dave is sitting there, okay, so you can ask. So basically, the mooring, the mooring, the first one was 35 days. So this is really a transformative uh, advance because prior to that it is only the, the, the ocean was observed when somebody was on a ship. But there's nothing left out there. And so this is the long term and I think this is the, the start of monitoring in the ocean. And so you can, see the, you can see the development. And so this is the beginning of the global tropical buoy array. So to forecast El Nino, so it is not, so but here are the, I think the, 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 the grandfathers, the granddaddies here of El Nino. So here is Mark Kane, here is Sarah Chick, the, the, the Kelvin, the, the dispersion relationship, Halpern, who did the mooring, and so George Philander, who, who, had, the, who had the paper that the, it's not just El Nino, it's not just an ocean, phenomenon, but it is a coupled instability of the, of the atmosphere and ocean system in the equatorial region. So we have to have the, so we have, we have to have the winds, the winds weaken, okay, and the Rossby waves, the Kelvin waves go uh, towards Peru and the Rossby waves goes towards Indonesia. But to do prediction, we need the Halpern moorings to know where the waves are, okay, now sea surface temperature, satellite observations of sea surface temperature doesn't tell you where the waves are going. So here is now Mark Kane's student, PhD student, Steve Zbiak's PhD thesis. So, so with the coupled instability you can see here from the equator, uh, da, 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 da. okay, so here in the equatorial Pacific, Pacific west, western, um, in the east, so this is time. So here is the wind stress and the thermocline depth. And so you can see when the winds weaken, there is the Kelvin wave propagating eastward and the thickening of the thermocline depth. And the other thing you notice is that the, the stronger, this is much easier to see when the easterlies are stronger, then you we have it's the time, it's a repeating thing. This is the instability, that is the recharge. So we have a period of about six years, which is of the order of what we observe. So where we are now, this is an operational forecast, three months. Um, so we have now many models participating in the forecast. We take the observation, this is observation from October, and so every month, they make a three-month forecast. So you can see this is November, December, January, and then, the, and then the next month, and then you make the forecast for December, January, February, et cetera. So you can see the forecast for now, it's about somewhere, it's warmer than normal, depending on the, the model, uh, it's about one degree warmer. And so now with modern satellite and modern data, we can see the Nino 3 region that was forecast that it is about one degree warmer. Okay, so we are on track for an El Nino, how big it is, you know, the forecasts, you know, from the forecast, I wouldn't say it's going to be a big El Nino. So the next step, the next thing, so now we have covered weather forecasting of about, about two weeks, to so seasonal forecasting, and I want to go into longer term. And the PhD thesis that inspired this is that of Dave Keeling's thesis at Caltech. Keeling's thesis was to study uranium in granite. Okay, so <laughs> he built a vacuum extraction system to isolate the CO2 gas from each sample of air and acidified water, and so, and he, and et cetera. So, but one question he asked is because he needed to know the, the, the one question he asked is, is the CO2 in the air constant? Should he just go to the literature and pick a value? Okay, so, 
So then he built a system and he tested the air samples and he liked camping. So he, he went to Big Sur State Park and it was great for him to go and he got permission to go. So is the CO2 constant? Obviously it was not, okay? So he did his thesis on uh, uranium and granite. And so came the, the International Geophysical Year and the people in NOAA in Washington found out that there's this young man called Dave Keeling who has built this instrument. Okay, <laughs> okay, so they, caught, they, they are, so they, and with Roger Ravel, uh, they sent Dave Keeling up the mountain. Okay, and so here we start the, the CO2 monitoring at Mauna Loa. So here is the, the first set of data from Mauna Loa CO2. And you note, I marked the, the, the amplitudes, it went between 310 and 315 parts per million. And so, but you can see very clearly the seasonal cycle of CO2 at Mauna Loa. Um, Dave, in his prefatory in annual reviews, said, why did I devise such an elaborate sampling strategy when my experiment didn't really need it? The reason was simply that I was having fun. Okay, he also mentioned in that prefatory that, that he had no clue when he was doing his thesis that this instrument that he, he made, that he built, uh, to just ask a very simple question, is CO2 in the air constant, would be the rest of his career. So, um, so here is the familiar, the familiar, um, I don't need to explain that this figure, the CO2 at Mauna Loa Observatory. So from when Keeling took, when Keeling started, when it was about 310 and 315, we're now over 400 parts per million uh, of CO2. And so when we look at the CO2, the seasonal cycle that, that Keeling saw at Mauna Loa, here we see very repetitive CO2, and the peak is in October, and the trough is in May. So this is the hypothesis, the only thing that could explain that is photosynthesis, the terrestrial biosphere. So when I started doing this, there were no data. For, I have a model, there's no problem uh, with the atmospheric uh, model. So what, I've, what we've figured out is how do we know when, the, when CO2 is taken from the atmosphere? So there's my allergies. So when my allergies, so this is the, the functions were in, the, in the computer code were called sneeze. Um, and so then we have the sneeze function and the rot function when you go hiking, whether there's stuff rotting on the ground. And so you can see that what we hypothesize there is that the growing season in the northern, northern mid-latitude is concentrated um, in the summer, and then the decay season is much longer. So for given amount, then what is shaded is what, the, what is felt by the atmosphere. So in the subtropics in the northern hemisphere, this, the longer growing season, decay may be, may be fairly constant throughout, and so you can see how, how, what the atmosphere sees. And so the, one of the challenges, one of the conversations at that time was there's so much, so many trees in the tropics, we should feel that, but you can imagine in this particular line of thinking, then the, the the uptake of CO2 and the release of CO2 will be approximately synchronous. It's fairly aseasonal, something that we know is not totally true now, but at the time, you know, so that the, the, while there's a lot of going, a lot of photosynthesis and a lot of release, the, they cancel out, they synchronous and the atmosphere doesn't feel that much of the tropics. So here comes Jim Tucker, who's sitting over there. Uh, and this was his PhD thesis uh, to do the spectral estimation of grass canopy variables. So he basically measured the spectral responses of, of, of grasses. Um, and so we will see what this lead to. But also what is important here is that there's a Tucker and Maxwell paper that talks about sensor design. 
It's one thing you go to the laboratory and you can pick an instrument and measure the, measure the spectrum uh, at any resolution. But what, what Tucker did as a postdoc at NASA Goddard, um, not only was he measuring um, in, the, in the belts film, uh, measuring grasses and doing uh, spectrometer measurements, he went down to NOAA headquarters and say, you guys are the, the, the satellite, the weather satellite, the AVHR is not designed properly, uh, that the bands overlap and you should separate the bands. Okay, so uh, I don't know how many times he went down, but I thought, my gosh, as a postdoc, he went to tell the satellite guys about the instruments. So anyway, so that's the sensor design. And so here, the, 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 the fundamental idea here is that you can see a function of, wave, of, of wavelength and reflectivity. If we look at this, what looks like to me, you know, I always call this a square root function. So green leaves reflect in the green and absorb in the red and blue here, and then they reflect in the near infrared. And so, whereas if we look at if we look at the dry bare soil, it's fairly flat like this. Okay. So, if we look at the near infrared versus the visible uh, part of the spectrum, we Jim defined the normalized difference vegetation index as the difference between the near infrared and the visible divided by the sum. And I thought the normalization was absolutely brilliant, but you don't have to worry about sun angles and the seasons and everything else. Uh, so I think these days I read papers that use the NDVI. They don't even spell out the NDVI. They don't reference Tucker. So now this is part of our lingo. Uh, and Jim is there, and he can he can elaborate on what he has done. So this is the this is the sci the cover of science that has a that had us all sitting up. Prior to this satellite observation, I think ecology is fairly local endeavor. And so here we see Tucker, the Africa, African land cover classification uses satellite cover. You can see changes uh, of the whole continent. So this, so this is 1985. And so from there, we can, I can now take the, take, the, take the data, so this is, when, this is when Jim, I have to say that Jim Tucker not only went down to tell the weather, guy, the, the weather satellite guys to separate the bands, so now we have the, satellite obs the, satellite, the observations on, on weather satellites, okay, not just, uh, and he processed all the data himself. Okay, and all the, all the calibration and everything. So here is the zonal mean of the NDVI. So you can see these blobs, so the growing season over three years. You can see the summer growing season. You can see the tropics is fairly uh, green most of the time, and there's the southern hemisphere out of phase. So if we put the CO2 on top of it, and the back is the, what we just showed you in DVI, if we take the CO2 and take the flux, the dCO2 dt, you can see how it lines up beautifully. So this is where we're off to the races. Okay, so now we have satellite observations of the timing of photosynthesis over the globe, and now since 1982 to now, we have a very long time series with which we can with which we can uh, look at changes in the, in the terrestrial biosphere and the effect of, of droughts, of insect infestations and everything else, land cover change. And so there's Jim sitting over there. So here, I don't, I don't think I need to go over this figure. So uh, we see now globally the, the, the uh, northern, the, the green wave going, there's less photosynthesis here and progressing uh, forward. Um, and now we have this um, for high resolution and I, at high temporal and high spatial resolution for multiple decades. So all of that has led us to now, I just jump forward in time to the IPCC AR5, 
where now we are talking about Earth system models. So when we had, when we talked about weather forecasting, we talk, talked mainly about the atmosphere. When we talked about El Nino forecasting, we bringing in the ocean. And all this time, they are, they are the model development and all in all directions. And so in AR5, we actually have interactive carbon cycle in the coupled atmosphere, land, ocean, cryosphere models. So here in the upper figure is if we didn't allow climate to change, if we fix the climate, if we, if we have the radiative CO2 at 280 ppm, but let the, uh, let, the, let the plants and the ocean respond to the CO2, then you can see fertilization. Okay, CO2 fertilize, fertilization is gain over the land because of higher CO2, and that enhances fertilization. So the land would gain carbon. But if we now allow the climate to change, the lower figure, the, the, then what we find is that it's the opposite. So while there is on the land, while there is increasing CO2 would enhance, would enhance photosynthesis, there, the climate is changing, and so there's additional decomposition, but also warming would dry the soils, and so where in one particular uh, realization in the previous IPCC, the, rain, the rainforest collapsed. Okay, so there's a lot of carbon released back into the atmosphere. So here is looking at the feedbacks between the climate Okay, so that the climate change would also reduce the, would reduce the carbon uptake, the land sink. But similarly for the ocean sink, the, the heating of the surface, the increase, the, the ocean column becomes more stably stratified because you're warming, you're warming the surface. And so this, this penetration of CO2 of heat to the, to the deeper ocean slows down because the column becomes more stably stratified. The solubility of the ocean, um, solubility of CO2 decreases with temperature, so there's more outgassing from the, soil, from the temperature effect. And the pH, as the ocean takes up carbon, the pH decreases, the ocean, the ocean becomes more acidic, and so that pushes the carbon in chemistry to CO2, and that pushes the, 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 that pushes the CO2 out. So there are all these factors Okay, that when we put in the carbon, carbons, uh, carbon climate feedbacks, then what we find is that the capacity of the land and ocean to absorb CO2 decreases uh, with the climate warming. So I want to end here with the outlook. I've deliberately chosen in this historical, in the history uh, talk, to focus on several PhD theses, okay? And I think the, I hope the, I hope the message I want to send to you is that there's fundamental work that may not be relevant. Charney wasn't thinking about weather forecasting. He was just trying to understand the waves, you know, that are contained in his equations. Keeling certainly wasn't thinking about atmospheric CO2. I don't know what Tucker was thinking about when he did, when he did the spectrometer. And Mark Kane wasn't thinking about El Ninos. We didn't know about El Nino. We didn't know a lot about that. But where the work that is fundamental research, and especially Keeling's comment, that it was fun, okay, it is what we want, it's intriguing, and it is what has led to all the development here. So the new questions, new theories, I started putting together my list and I thought, no, I can, you know, that here we are at the AGU, uh, that there are all the talks here, the new questions, new theories, new observations, and so some of them, okay, some of them will lead to new breakthroughs that, like the ones we have seen. Okay, not just breakthroughs in theories, but breakthroughs in technology, breakthroughs in capabilities, and breakthroughs in thinking. And so here, and the other part I want to emphasize here by, by, by picking the PhD thesis is that the other part of, of 
advances is you, okay? Are the young people, it's a, and especially, I hope I'm not yet, I'm not yet put to pasture, that, that there's still, that about the people who are thinking and people doing the work. Okay, so I want to end with something from our good friend John Tyndall, and that is a cartoon of him in, a cartoon of him in a Vanity Fair. Um, so uh, he wrote, the scientific use of imagination. I don't think anyone <laughs> would write a paper with a title like that. I believe even before an audience like the present to uncover some extent the unseen things of nature and thus to give not only to professed students but to others with the necessary bias, industry, and capacity, an intelligent interest in the operation of science. Time and labor are necessary to this result, but science is the gainer from the public sympathy thus created. So I thank you very much. Thank you, Inez. We have time for questions. And Rong has a microphone, so if you just raise your hand, she'll come and uh, take, the, take the question. And Dave Halpern and Jim Tucker are here too, so I think that you can ask them to talk about what, what brought them to do what they did, because I'm just being an admirer uh, of what they have accomplished. Well, if no one, maybe I ask a question. I pass this uh, as soon as I find other. So uh, I think these, uh, uh, your talk really eloquently illustrate the importance of a fundamental, perhaps curiosity-driven research. But in today's funding environment, that become harder and harder. And as a community, how could we uh, com uh, communicating or convincing uh, you know, funding agency or decision making, uh, we need this kind of room and freedom to, uh, to advance the science. Well, I think if you look at the funding um, of all the funding sources, they are mission-driven agencies and they have the mission, but the National Science Foundation, their mission is fundamental research. So there's still opportunities uh, in the U.S., and we've worked very hard to emphasize that basic research, fundamental research, is the is is the driver for the economy of the country. So there is room. There are still people advocating in Washington. There's tremendous support in government. Maybe not what you read in the newspapers, but there's tremendous support in the government uh, for fundamental research. So it's there. Uh, it, it may, it may, the funding calls may, may be slightly different than what you want to see. <laughs> For example, convergent research or something. Okay, so basically trying to move the field forward rather than do the same thing over and over again. So, so sometimes you don't recognize the funding calls because there's a push to go forward in a new direction. Great talking, Inez. Uh, one question I would have is, as we started into weather prediction, there was a big surge around the world to put together a global observing weather system. The World Meteorological Organization was created. All the nations commit to do that. Can you comment on why we haven't seen the same integrated attack on a climate observing system? And your thoughts there? The global, the GARP, Global Atmospheric Research Program, was created during the Kennedy administration. And that was when, we, when, um, when there was Russia, the Cold War. And it was Jerry Wiesner was uh, Kennedy's science advisor. And Jerry Wiesner from MIT, he was instrumental in the development of the radar. And so the, what is the peaceful collaboration between nations, and science was one. And so Charney was pulled in uh, by Wiesner, and they, and they created, and they talked about peaceful collaboration through science. 
And so that was the Global Atmospheric Research Program. And so I go to, to Ravel, uh, also during the Kennedy administration, um, the um, Abdul Salam, who was the science advisor to Pakistan, uh, was going to come to Washington and to ask Kennedy for help with nuclear weapons. So Jerry Wiesner, the, the president, the president of Pakistan was going to come to the president of the U.S. to ask for help with nuclear weapons. And so Jerry Wiesner, the science advisor, talked to Abdul Salam, who's the science advisor, his counterpart in Pakistan, and say, what can we, what can we um, help with that they cannot de that they cannot say no to, and so that was when the desal the salination of the fields was a serious problem. So Roger Ravel was the director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and he said they thought I knew about salt water. <laughs> so so he went to he went to Pakistan and he did you know he had studies you know how to pump etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it turns out that it was not just the pumping of the so it's not just the issue of when he got there it's not just the issue of salt water but how do you teach farmers how to use water, et cetera, and the, and the, and the transport of food, et cetera, et cetera. So, so it's the peaceful. So he, he, he established a lot of the infrastructure or the thinking to, to put in the infrastructure uh, to, make, to, to produce food for the people. So the problem started with salination of the fields. And so this is where I have two examples from history where peaceful collaboration through science is one way. It's really one way uh, to c have collaboration between nations. And we do have a role to play in that, in, very much in that regard. I really enjoyed this talk a lot. Um, and I wanted to push you on sort of what you ended with, which was how a lot of the science was a lot of fun. Yes. And um, given a lot of the science is used to, in the IPCC reports, I feel a lot of anxiety now, in, rather than fun, in the research that I do. So I wanted you to comment on how do we deal with uh, using the science and actually making change especially where we are today with the scientific understanding and how sort of, I don't know, I just feel very conflicted with uh, your end, the, your the, end the, message. The, this, this, what you have to do, right? There is the collaboration and I, IPCC is an example of international collaboration, a, a, a collaboration across nations among scientists. But what I try to do to keep myself sane is I, I have my own little problem, which is not IPCC problem. I play with Lorenz calculations. I have play with Lorenz models. To keep myself engaged and entertained, it is not funded because it is a little model that runs on my little computer. And so I keep myself, I keep myself going uh, by, having, by having still, I'm in this, I'm in science because I, I liked it. I, li I still like it. So I still have to keep a little bit for myself, which is not get caught up by the big machines and the, and the big data and everything else. Okay, so I still need a, what, what Steve Schwartz talked about earlier today is the simple model. Okay, it is really fun to play with it and think about things and, and it's fun to close my eyes and imagine, lie on the couch and imagine. <laughs> okay, so Tyndall gives me the marvelous excuse to go lie on the couch and imagine things. And I think that, you know, what we've learned from a lot of studies on brain science is that one part of your brain collects the information, you have to go to sleep, and the other part organizes the information. When Charney talked about his, uh, his so simple you know, the filtering, that he was walking in a park, okay? He couldn't, you know, he did all the, the all, at the time, paper, the, the equations, and then he was walking in the park when the idea came to him. So you have to do something uh, to balance out, to keep yourself in the game, you know, engaged. So don't get caught up by, you know, the deadlines. 
Uh, Chuck Hakarainen, retired from EPRI. Uh, Tyndall's comment here points out that it's not only important for scientists to explain their work to other scientists, but if explaining it to, to something that the public can understand builds, as he says, public sympathy, which I term yes. to be public interest yes. and support. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in today's world, and some of the other talks and other sessions here, I'm hearing that it's very difficult for the secondary education community to recruit teachers in the earth sciences, the sciences that are handled by AGU, that they're traditionally coming from biology or uh, physics backgrounds or mathematics backgrounds. So I was wondering your comment on what's the prospects for actually continuing to get the, the, the younger students to take up careers in science if they're not getting enough uh, support at the educational level at secondary schools. Well, I hope that many of our students will consider teaching at all levels. So it is not just getting a career in, as a college professor or, your, or in a research lab, but to think about uh, teaching at the early stages to engage students to spark their interest uh, and to teach at the secondary, you know, middle school and secondary school levels. I know for my university, we have a Calteach program where the students get both a bachelor's degree and a teacher's certificate so that they would go back into, the, into teaching the earlier grades. So I think that it is very much, I can, I can go on and on, but I don't, you don't want me to go on about how, how young children learn and, how, and who influences them. But there are many, I think that it's, it's in encouraging our students for us to focus at the early education as well. And how do we multiply that by through our, our undergraduates and our master's students? Let's have our last question. Uh, thank you. Daryl Williams, NASA Goddard, retired. Uh, first of all, I, as I really enjoyed the her historical walkthrough. It was, it was quite entertaining. You, part of your sub-theme here today would seem to be a recognition of uh, Tucker, who was a colleague of mine. We came to Goddard with each, within a year of each other. And uh, he not only impacted the bands on AVHRR, but he had some significant input to the thematic mapper on Landsat's uh, 4 and 5 and, and hence. But uh, some of it is fortunate because he, he was interested in grasses, so he could go out and hold a radiometer over a grass canopy. My background happened to be in forestry. It was a whole lot harder to get above a forest canopy. And uh, it was rather frustrating for some of us colleagues of his because we were being told we had to go back to the basic principles. We were processing Earth or Landsat data at the time. And Jim had gone from going to the grasses, looking at, at coarse resolution Landsat like, but AVHRR. So, uh, but, but anyway, it was a, quite a ride uh, sitting there you know, and interacting with those guys as he did all that. So. But again, thank you very much for the historical perspective. Thank you. All right, if you can just uh, have two more quick things here. And first, let's give one final round of applause for, to Inez for a wonderful presentation. Also, we're going to give her an award in just a minute, but given the discussion that we just had and some of the questions, you know, in terms of uh, people thinking about their careers and having fun or possibly not having as much fun as they thought they might have, I wanted to call your attention to an event that we're having this evening, sponsored by Global Environmental Change. This was put together by three of our early career uh, uh, members and it's called get out of your discipline and it's going to be an evening of networking and panel discussion for students and early career AGU attendees but we what we ha we have also invited more senior scholars to to join them and we're going to have <coughs> excuse me have tables set up so that we can have the early career with maybe the middle and some of us gray-haired people uh, getting together to talk about careers and opportunities, et cetera. So this, is not, this event is not just for the early career people, but the people with whom I think that they need to rub shoulders and get some, uh, hear your experiences. And so let me just, if you want to come, it, it's free, and there will be some food. Uh, it's gonna be at the Grand Hyatt, 
and it's down on the independence level and it will be well marked. And everyone here is invited to come and join our early career uh, scientists. So with that, I'm going to give Inez Thank you. a certificate. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.